Welcome to the Circuit of Success. I'm your host, Brett Gilliland, and uh, the co-founder and CEO of Visionary Wealth Advisors. And today we've got John Fisher, uh, Chief Investment Officer of Visionary Wealth Advisors. John, how are you doing today? Brett, doing great. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. It's good to have you back. You've been on here a few times. It's always good to connect and talk a little bit about the stock market and what's going on in the world. Yeah, it's good to be back and uh, glad I got an, uh, another invitation. So Absolutely. I'll take it when I can get it. That's right. That's right. So there's been a few things going on in the last couple of months. Would you agree with that? Uh, just no, just a few that might cause a little consternation or a little bit of a upset stomach. That's right. So uh, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about kind of the stock market overall, talk about some takeaways uh, that we would recommend for, for clients, for prospects, for just really anybody listening to this that uh, is worried about their money and what's going on in the stock market. And also about the election, right? If you've, uh, you've had to live under a rock, if you didn't know the elections were going on and what that could potentially do to your portfolio. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, you know, but some of my notes, John, we've, you know, we've talked a lot about this, but you know, we went from the uh, overall from a stock market, went fastest from market peak to bear market, right? We uh, sharpest decline in history in the first quarter and the second quarter and the fastest bear recovery in the stock market history. So when you think about that, that's a lot, right? It's a lot in our nine months that we've had here in the year. Uh, so talk to us about that. What do you think about the market overall? Yeah, Brad, I think it's a year. It's certainly been a year for the record books when you think about what's happened in the first nine months. And there's, you know, you see that the S&P started making new market highs in February, up 5% up till February 19th when uh, the COVID decline uh, came in. Uh, to call it decline would be an understatement. Um, and, you know, what we saw is since then, the S&P has actually rallied up 50 plus percent since that time frame, uh, basically recovering the losses that we sustained in March and April. Right. And so while the stock market has come roaring back, you know, the economy is, has not been quite as fast, right? You look at unemployment is still at 8% approximately. Um, and you look at GDP and, you know, while GDP will have a nice bounce back in the third quarter from the, the second quarter economic shutdown, um, we're still looking at likely several years before we see the total GDP come back to pre-COVID levels, or in other words, back to 2019 levels. Um, so I think when you look at, there is reason for optimism looking forward. When you look at expectation for better corporate earnings and for uh, the a COVID vaccine and distribution, but I think that you know we're likely to see a little bit more uncertainty. Um, the growth will be a little bit more uneven, and with that unevenness, you know. Investors should expect a little more volatility as we enter into a time that is going to be surrounded by the, the uncertainty of the elections and the uncertainty of a vaccine and distribution from, uh, for COVID. Yeah. So when you think about that and all that stuff, so it's great information, but you know, this is something I'm hearing from, from clients and even people, if you're you know, at a social event, you know, are the markets overvalued right now? What are your thoughts on yeah. that, John? Yeah, it's a great question, Brett. Um, and I think, look, if you look by traditional metrics, the answer would be yes. Um, and when I say traditional metrics, we talk about price to earnings ratio or PE ratio is a common terminology. What you pay for a dollar of earnings for a company in the S&P 500. In the past 25 years, the average, S or the average PE ratio of the S&P 500 has been 16. Well, right now we're around 21. So that tells you by, by traditional measures, we are, the market is overvalued. Um, but I'm going to offer you two reasons why the answer is not Can I interrupt so real quick there, John? I, I'm sorry to do that, but I like to yeah. just kind of spend some time on that. So when you say PE ratio, price earnings ratio, like we understand that, right? So maybe for the person that doesn't know what that is, but they see it on their iPhone, right? On the PE. Could you explain that a little bit? What is a PE ratio and what's that mean for me as an investor? Yeah, it means for an investor, um, just like if you would buy a house and you're looking for the value of a house relative to another, another house, it's a metric that allows you to compare the current prices of stocks now versus other times in history. And so, in other words, the PE ratio is if you were to look at the, the S&P 500, 500 companies, and looked at the average company um, you know, over the past 25 years, and you were to buy that company for a dollar of profit for any of the average company, it would cost you $16 to get a dollar of profit for the average company S&P 500. Okay. In terms of if you were to buy that, right? Just like you would buy a business, a mom and pop shop of an ice cream store, right? How much are you paying for the earning, for the income you expect to get each year? Okay, makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. So I interrupted, so I'll let you continue on what you were talking about there. Yeah, I, I appreciate the clarification there. And so um, I think there's two reasons why the um, why valuations and being the market being overvalued isn't so simple. Uh, first is the fact that we're in historically low interest rates. Um, during the past 25 years, we've never seen interest rates this low. 
And that has a, a effect on both you know, returns on stocks and their valuations. When you look at the current price of a stock in theory, it should be looking at all the future profits that that company is going to make and valuing those profits back to today, right? Or, or assume, including all those profits in the future and figuring out what that company is worth today based on those future profits. And we won't go into the, into the, techn the technicalities of how you value that, Brett, but what you need to know is that in general, when interest rates are lower, that makes each future uh, cash flow in the future more valuable. And so when interest rates are lower, those cash flows are more valuable, meaning investors are willing to pay more for stocks. And certainly we're seeing that in the current environment that with historically low interest rates, that valuations, it, it makes sense that valuations would be higher because those cash flows, those future profits are theoretically worth more in a low interest rate environment. The second reason why I would tell you why the valuation, whether we're overvalued or not, is not so simple is the Federal Reserve. When you look at the past six months, the Federal Reserve has taken historical steps to support both the economy and the financial markets. They've sent a message both directly and indirectly that they're willing to do whatever it takes to keep the, the economy and the stock market afloat. You know, so, you know, we're in the cusp of baseball playoffs. So to use a baseball analogy, you know, if you go on um, online, look at your at the baseball game that's going to happen, and you look at the odds of, of one team winning. It's usually between 50-50, maybe at best a 60% chance of winning or 40% if team is favored or not favored, right? Well, what would those odds look like if all of a sudden a team could say, they had the bases loaded and made a third out, but they could say, nope, let's stop. We get a fourth or fifth out in an inning. Hmm. What would that do to the odds of them winning that game? Go way up. Go way up, right? How, how far, how, how high? It's hard to value because if you could get an extra out whenever you wanted it, you know, your chances of winning would be much higher. The, and, and that same analogy works for the, the market right now is that the Fed has created extra outs for the economy and the stock markets by their support. And so the fact that they're willing to create those extra outs for the economy and the stock market means that investors are willing to pay more for stocks right now. And we go back to that PE ratio. Another thing I would say is, you know, if you, if you look at utility stocks, for example, and said normally you have to pay 12 times earnings uh, for a utility stock normally, well, if you knew the Fed was willing to do whatever it took to keep the market afloat, is that utility stock now worth 15 times earnings, 17 times earnings? It's an easy question to ask, but it's really difficult to answer. And right. so for those reasons, I think that's why the question, are we overvalued, isn't so simple. But I'll say in the, in the big picture is in the short term, valuations tell us very little about the direction of the market in the next 12 months. So I wouldn't focus on the valuations as we look about what's going to happen in the near term. But there's no doubt over the next five to 10 years, as you expand your time horizon, that valuations have a very meaningful effect on total returns. So for investors looking at their long-term plan, the fact that valuations are higher, it's something we need to consider of how do we need to adjust our plan for the expectation that over the longer term, returns are likely to be lower than historical averages. Got it. Well, I think that makes me to go to the next question is, so the valuations, you know, we look at five and 10 year, like you just said, but what about the presidential election, right? We, if you've heard it once, you've heard it a thousand times in the last 60 days, right? Is, hey, what's going to happen to my portfolio with this stock market or with the, uh, with the election coming up? And, and so obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but, but if you were to look at that short term, long term, what effects is the presidential election going to have on, on a portfolio? Well, Brett, so I normally get out my magic eight ball and then shake it. And then that's right. usually my answer that I'll go with just a hundred percent. Perfect. <laughs> um, but no, in, in all seriousness, I think what you said is very important is you made a difference between short term and long term, right? In the short term, there's, there is evidence that um, the presidential election creates uncertainty in the short term or creates additional volatility mm -hmm. in the market because of the uncertainty. Markets dislike uncertainty and certainly elections of who's going to run uh, the, the U.S. for the next four years creates uncertainty. So investors should expect short-term volatility here in the near term. But and, and aside, I also say, Brett, beside the, the fact that we're going to see short-term volatility from the elections, we're also going to see, see short-term volatility in the, in the last quarter of the year due to the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic we haven't seen in a century. So a lot of the volatility we could also see in the, in the, in the fourth quarter is due to the fact that the timing and uncertainty of the timing of, the, of both the vaccine and its distribution. Now, if we go bigger in terms of the effects of presidential elections on the long term, there's a litany of evidence that illustrates who's elected the next president will have very little effect on market returns. The result of the presidential elections are not a long term driver of returns. What really drives the market in the long term is market fundamentals. Like, look, we're buying stocks, right? We want stocks, we want companies that are making money, right? So, market fundamentals like corporate earnings, 
like the health of the economy, interest rates. Those are the types of things that have long-term effects on market returns, not who's going to be elected as president. And we see that in the, in, the, in the research, right? Since 1860, a 60-40 portfolio of stocks and bonds has averaged 8.4% under a Democratic president and 8.2% under a Republican president. So the results are basically the same, regardless of who is in Oval Office. And certainly, it's a message that the election creates a lot of media noise, but it shouldn't be used as part of our long-term investment decisions. Which is, uh, I think people, you know, I've asked that question to people before, kind of a trick question. And I think people think that the numbers are going to be way different. And, and reality is they're not, right? So if you are that client and you're listening to this right now and you get your portfolio and you're sitting here and you're thinking, <clears throat> all right, what changes should they make ahead of the election? Or what changes should they make right after the election? Yeah, Brett. And again, uh, if we had a nickel for every time we got this question or heard this question or saw it talked about in the in the media, uh, we'd be on a beach, right? Right. Um, and I think if you haven't heard already, get ready because it's coming, right? If You'll hear if candidate X wins, that it'll be good for stocks. Yeah. And if candidate Y wins, it'll be good for financials, good for technology, and bad for healthcare, right? Or something of that accord. Sure. Right? Well, let's look, let's go take a, a brief trip down history uh, lane to see how that holds up. Let's go back to the 2016 election. The day before the election, Hillary Clinton was given a 90% chance of winning the election. So for those investors who lined up their investments and altered their investments based on that 90% chance, that was that was a, a poor decision, right? Yep. And at the, at the same time, there was a lot of really smart economists, and the consensus was that if Trump wins, that the market would fall. Because whether you like him or dislike him, the market viewed him his, his policy and overall him as unpredictable. And we know the markets don't like uncertainty. Well, and I remember that night, at, it was midnight on election night back in 16. We were texting back and forth. The market's down a thousand plus in the futures, right? And we're thinking, okay, it's going to be an interesting morning, right? And, and to your point, Brett, the economists were right for about uh, 12 to 18 hours. Right. The market opened up down 5% and it closed about flat for the day by the time that the day was done. That's right. And from there, we know what the market did under, uh, since Trump has taken office. And so it's just a reminder um, that when you think about, so that was our most recent experience of 2016. They got the original outcome of, of Hillary Clinton winning wrong. And the consensus was that, and they got wrong about what would happen if Trump won right. uh, the presidency. So what gives you confidence as an investor that this time will be any different than the, than the previous time of their ability to get the outcome right or the market reaction? And you know we can take one more look at this going back to 2008. Back in 2008, naysayers believed that President Obama taking office would be bad for um, the markets. They, you know, his increased regulation were "quote unquote" anti-business, and so that would hurt the markets. And they also said Obamacare would ruin healthcare stocks. Right? Um, well, what did the S&P 500 do during Obama's tenure? The S&P 500 was up 15 and a half percent per year, which is, you know, the average historical returns are around nine percent. So that's hardly anti-business returns. Right. And healthcare stocks average 15% per year. So hardly the death cross for healthcare stocks that everyone thought it would be at election time in 2008. And so, Brad, I think it's really important that those are really good examples that, and, and let me repeat, or let me, it's, it's worth saying that um, the markets did really well during Obama's tenure in large part because he took over right after the markets had gotten uh, their cheapest value in a long time right after the great financial recession. Yep. And so the fact that market valuations were so cheap played a large role in the success of the market during President Obama's tenure. But that's exactly the point is that what happened in the market was driven by market fundamentals, not who was in the executive office. Yep. So a uh, good question here. This is probably one question you're gonna absolutely love. So should I be rooting for the Republicans or the Democrats to win the presidency and or control of Congress? Sure you love yeah, that. and Brett, I think the key point there is as an investor, right? If you keep your as political affiliations aside, if I'm looking just at my portfolio, who should I root for? Right. That's absolutely and there's, right. there's, there's plenty of data out there about um, if a Republican is in, wins the presidency and uh, Congress is split or vice versa. And I think there's, you know, you have to be careful with the historical data about returns upon which party controls the presidency and Congress for two reasons. Um, first of all, Oftentimes that data comes from a limited number of examples or what you know, stat nerds like myself, you might call a small sample size. Right. So since 1948, when Republicans have held the executive branch and control of Congress, 
the markets have averaged 11.8% per year. That sounds great, right? Now, what if I told you that's only happened three times since 1948 over the past 72 years? Would you say, is that, is that meaningful data or is that luck or coincidence, right? And so in keeping with our baseball analogy, um, you know, Brett, last year I went to, you know, we're, we're saying, we're, you know, as you have the Cardinals hat in the background, we're Cardinals fans, mm -hmm. right? Um, did you know last year I went to three Cardinals games and I had a hot dog at each game and they won each of those three games. So you got to do it every time. Do you think it would be smart to say that if I went to all 81 home games, if I could, um, that they would win all of those games because I ate a hot dog? Uh, that would not be smart. That would not be smart, right? Um, and so that's a reminder again that, um, by the way, never mind in those three games that the Cardinals faced uh, a bad team or the, the, the other team's worst pitcher, yeah. or they happen to score twice as many runs as normal, right? Those are the parts that you need to remember that, um, you know, oftentimes market events happen, like asset bubbles, recessions, or recoveries, that had nothing to do with who the current president was at the time. The worst market returns we've seen um, over time was between 1928 to 1932. Uh, president Hoover, annualized returns of negative 20%. This was the, 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 the cusp of the Great Depression, right? Depression, yeah. what, what role did, uh, did President Hoover have in the Great Depression? Do we think that the president caused the Great Depression? Yeah, no. Right? The Great Depression was, had, there were excesses in the marketplace that were building up over years before he took office. He was the, he just happened to be the unlucky soul right. who took office. Won the race, yeah. On the, in the race, when the Great Depression happened, that was a 10 year long duration, right? And so, but that, that data around President Hoover is applied to Republicans because he was the one who was in office, even though that market event was years in the making. If you come a little bit closer more to, to our time, and you look in the past 40 years, there's only been one president who's had negative annualized returns during their term. It's been George W. Bush. Now he took office in, um, in, in January of 2001. And you know when he took office in 2001, that was, that was after the tech bubble burst in March of 2000. Yep. So, you know, George W. Bush had the worst market returns of any president in the last 40 years. What role did George W. Bush have in the, the, the role of investors buying tech stocks that had no revenues in the late 90s? Yeah, zero. Right. What role did he have in the tech bubble bursting eight months before he was even elected? Yeah. And, and the other part I would think about, Brett, is what, a, you know, so when he took office, the, the tech bubble had already kind of burst and started to, you know, that, 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 that the, the, the horse had left the gate, right? Or horse had left the barn for nine months. What, what abilities would he have had to stop that? Or another word, and trying to be bipartisan, is would a Democratic president be able to stop the tech bubble from bursting over that time frame, right? Um, did George W. Bush, what policies did he have that created, you know, the tragic events of 9-11? And then if that wasn't enough, George, uh, unfortunately, on the back end, he was part of that, uh, the, 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 the great financial recession with the real estate bubble. And so, again, those are all market events that were driven by excesses in the economy and bubbles, not who's in the Oval Office. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No. OK, so I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I, I couldn't agree more. And, and there's, there's another player in this, right, is. There's certainly your portfolio. There's when you buy, there's when you get out, there's all those things. But the other player in this is what effects does the media have on us? Yeah. And I think the media is, is really important. I call this the, the older sibling syndrome, Brett. Um, when I was a kid, I have an older sister and she would, um, she'd push my buttons when I was young and it just drive me nuts. Right. And eventually I won't tell you how old I was because it's older than I should have been. Right. I realized what she was doing and what her intentions were. And I said, you know what? I know what you're doing and I'm not going to let you do it. Right. It's weird right. that you were in college when that happened. But. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said, well, that, that, strike right. that from the record, right? right. right. Um, but that's the same message with the media is that it's important to understand that with the media, what their intentions are before you access that media so you have a better ability to, to withstand your own personal emotions and your long-term plan. I always say, I've said, we've had this conversation before, in any aspect of business, it's important to understand how the other side gets paid. So when you look at financial media, when you flip on your favorite uh, you know, TV, financial TV station, are they getting paid for accurate predictions or are they getting paid for viewership? Right. Viewership. right? They're, getting paid, they're getting paid for viewership. And so their goal for those people who are buying those ads, 
do the, those companies who are buying ads on their on those time slots, do they care about accurate predictions or do they care about the volume of viewers seeing their ad? Yeah. And so it's a reminder that when we're looking at financial media, and you know, again, there's the old adage that with financial media or with with all media that uh, or with news that if it bleeds, it leads. And the the the, the financial side of that is you, financial media is normally selling greed or fear because they want your viewership, right? And it's important, and again, this is not that all financial media or, or news is bad, but it's important to know that their goals of viewership doesn't necessarily align with your goals and your financial plan, nor is it probably aligned with your time horizon when you hear some of these picks that are, they're swapping out of one thing today and trading it next week. Yes. And you know, the last thing that me, I always remind people of, we go back to baseball, is when you see a batter go up to the, to the plate and you're watching on TV, they post that batting average right up in that screen. So before they even take a swing, you know the likelihood of that batter getting a hit. Well, when was the last time you turned on your favorite news state, your favorite financial news station, right. and saw that prediction followed by that batting average from your that that market expert, so to speak? Yeah, yeah it doesn't happen, doesn't exist because they're just going to say anything. And I always like to talk about there's no accountability to that, right? right? They can say buy ABC or do this. Well, there, there's no accountability to that. Right. But if, if you or I say that with a, with an individual and you're sitting at their kitchen table, or they're sitting here in the office, there's, 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 a, that's a big deal, right? You can't just say things like that just to try to get clickbait, if you will. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's more. absolutely right. And, and so that's the part where it's important to know that they're paid for predictions, yeah. not for, not to be right. And so again, the, the more that we can have control of our emotions before we go into a situation, right. the better we are able to not have our emotions be hijacked by, by what we're hearing or what we're seeing, right? And so that's why it's important just to understand the roles of the media. Their goal is to get you to watch longer to increase their viewership. And so it's important that you have that context when you're looking at some of that information. Brett, I have the TV on with our, my role all day long. I have it on mute, right? But I also know before I turn that TV on, I know what their, what their goals are. And so I'm taking the value that I see, but not necessarily taking the bait <laughs> like my right. sister gave me when I was younger right. when I'm watching financial news. Yeah. That's good. I'm glad you learned that lesson, John. And uh, not doing after that college. After college, right? That's good. So let's let's talk about some action steps. Obviously, you want to have a well diversified portfolio. If you're saving for retirement, you want to save money every single month, whether that's in a retirement account or what have you. Uh, you want to do those things. But what are some action steps today when somebody's listening to this? They can say, okay, here are some things that I need to start doing today, uh, based on some of this advice. Yeah, Brett, and I think you started with the idea of diversification, and we saw that in play out in a grand scale in March and April, that the value diversification is that you're owning different types of stocks and different types of bonds, mm -hmm. so they don't all move in the same direction at the same time. And so that's the value of having diversification in times like we saw in March and April. The other thing I would advise investors is to consider um, what lane you are in your portfolio. Uh, in terms of the, the speed of your lane, right? The balance of stocks and bonds. We saw a market expansion from 2010 to February of, of this year. A, after a 10-year market expansion, what we normally see is that, you know, because stocks do so well during that time frame, people get, take on more of a risk allocation to stocks versus bonds than they might normally have. Well, if that happened, and Brett, you, I'm sure you've had this experience with, with clients of your own, but if that happened, that made the volatility or the decline in March and April feel like that much more of a gut punch. Right. So the fact what if that I we, can too? I mean, I think doing this for 20 years, that's one of the biggest things that I see is most people don't understand what lane they're in, right? They, they right. have no idea or they may come in and they say, yeah, I'm in a, I'm in the sixth lane or the seventh lane. And then you look at their statements of what they own and they're in, you know, lane 10.5, right? And they have yeah. no clue. And Brett, that's the most important part, right? As I've always said, is that more important than what you own is that you can stay invested over the long term. That's right. And so if you look at um, the fact that we've the S and P has climbed back fifty percent, and we're basically right around where we were before the crash. Uh, before it, uh, it's basically a do over for any clients who may have said, you know what, March and April was more than I could stomach. I yeah. stayed the course, but so if you but if you found that to be more than you can stomach, now is a great time to sit down with your financial advisor and reevaluate the, the risk in your portfolio, the time horizon, and how, and, and how that all fits to your plan and your ability to stay invested even when it hurts a little bit yeah. or a lot. No, that's great advice, great advice. Um, one other thing I'll talk about is, is tax planning, Brett, and certainly you want to consult your tax uh, professional on this. But when you look at if Biden wins, there's a decent chance that we could see the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 either eliminated or heavily altered. 
Yeah. And so when you think about that, that could have an effect on individual taxes as well as corporate taxes. Um, and at the same time, even if Biden doesn't win, it's important to look at the context of where we're at as a country, which is to say, this year alone, we have a $3 trillion deficit. The total debt we have outstanding as a country is approximately $20 trillion or 100% of our annual GDP as a country. We haven't had that much debt outstanding since World War II. Hmm. So when you, you add to the fact that also, historically speaking, we're in relatively low marginal tax brackets, eventually that debt is going to be paid at, by whether, no matter who wins the next election. So there is risk that down the road that that, that that debt will have to be paid in the form of higher taxes. So when I think about the risk of higher taxes in the future, I think about Roth IRAs. I think about Roth 401ks. Uh, something that our advisors have been talking a lot about is considering partial uh, uh, IRA conversions, Roth IRA conversions. And from an investment standpoint, if you're worried about higher taxes, it might, you know, on a relative basis, could make municipal bonds more attractive because they're tax advantage nature. Because if we see taxes go up, you'll see more demand for those muni bonds. So I think one one thing as you're saying this too is that that makes me think about is how do I turn out the noise there, right? Because it's coming from this little thing right here in my phone, the alerts, right? It's coming from the TVs. It's coming from your friend at a social. It's everywhere, right? So how do I do? How do I turn off the noise? Yeah, and I don't know if you can turn out the noise, Brett, but at least you can make it sound like a, a white noise, like you would when you're trying to go to sleep. And you know, in, in terms of trying right. to create background, it doesn't noise, sound so like that sometimes. Though it doesn't sound like that all the time, for sure. And I think the way to do that is by having a plan and knowing what your goal is. Right? I, you know, on a Saturday with you know young kids, I may have a goal of doing you know three different things to get accomplished. But if I don't stop on Saturday morning and talk about and Blaine, Brett, you're a big planner. Um, but if I don't stop on a Saturday morning and say, here's the three things I want to get accomplished, yep. too often Saturday night comes around and I didn't get any of it done. But if I start before the day starts and say, here's the three things that I want to get done, I've got a much better chance of achieving that. And so I think that same thing applies when you're looking at financial media or your friends saying what they're doing, you know, they're taking these action steps, is to know what your plan is, what your stick and what your objectives are before you get into that kind of situation. So your emotions aren't hijacked. Your short-term emotions aren't hijacked, aren't hijacking your long-term plan. Yeah. yeah, that's good. So I'm going to bring up one last thing before we end. Um, I'll make you go back into the, uh, the memory here. Of, of you, you write a lot of pieces for Visionary Wealth Advisors. They're on our website. You go to visionarywealthadvisors.com. Check it out under the news section up at the top. And there's a lot of great pieces in there. Um, but you talked about soccer goalies. And, and I thought this was a great metaphor. I'm, I didn't grow up being a soccer player. I played a little bit as a kid, but I watched my kids play. So now I think about this all the time when, when I watch a soccer goalie. So, so spend some time on that. I was fascinated yeah. by that. Yeah, Brett, I get, uh, those are the kind of things that probably excite me more than they should. But I, right. I get excited when you can find an example in normal life that helps explain how investors, the, the challenges that we're facing on, on an everyday basis. And so the study that they did, they looked at um, elite soccer goalies, right? Um, and, and, and penalty kicks. And they looked at about 400 penalty kicks. And the idea of this research was to show, uh, was researching action bias, that we all have a desire, you know, not us, but our friends, don't just stand there, do something. And so this research looked at 400 penalty kicks to determine the optimal position for the goalie to stand when it comes to a penalty kick. Because, you know, Brett, you don't follow it much, but you probably follow enough to know the goalie has to make up their mind what they're doing right. before the ball is struck. And so what they found was, based on all that research, the most optimal position for the goalie was to stand in the middle of the goal for a penalty kick, not to dive left or right, but to do nothing, to stand there. Despite – now, Brett, I'm going to put you on the, on, the, on the spot here. You mentioned the, 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 uh, the article. Do you remember what percentage of the time those goalies dove left or right? I appreciate you putting me on the spot. No, I do not remember the percentage of what. Yeah. But, I would, but I would assume it was very high because, again, I think we're biased as humans that we feel like we action – there has to be action or doing nothing is, is just, is not good at all. Yeah. And Brett, in fairness, it was higher than even I expected. 94% of the time, wow. the goalies jumped left or right. Now, again, remember th these goalies are well incentivized to want to stop that ball. They're playing for their own personal pride. They're playing for the teams, you know, to win for the team. They're playing for their next contract and they're playing for endorsements, right? They have all the, the, the best intentions, all the best incentives to want to stop that ball and yet they make a decision 94% of the time to do what's giving them a less optimal chance of stopping that ball. Yeah. Why is that? Because they can say, well, at least I tried. Right. Right. They'll feel better about their decision is based on feeling better about losing 
than choosing the decision that gives them the best chance of winning. And so that's the message for investors is, you know, again, our friend says it, not us, but don't just stand there when times are rough, do something. Well, the, the feeling is that when things are going wrong, that we have to do something, but that, that's, a, that's the action bias that's going among us. Um, the founder of Vanguard said it best, Jack Bogle said, 99% of the time when, when you're seeing volatility markets are disrupted, there's an inclination, I'm sorry, you know, when markets are disrupted, there's an, there's an inclination to say, don't just stand there, do something. But 99% of the time, the best thing to do is don't do something, just stand there. Yeah. And certainly we saw that play out in the last election, as we've already talked about in 2016, when you saw people necessarily making, making uh, adjustments to their portfolio based on the almost guarantee that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Right. Or right. those people who just then said, I'm going to adjust my portfolio because the market's going to fall when, because Trump won. And so it's a reminder that it's hard to do when you're hearing all that noise from the TV, your friends, from all these different sources. But oftentimes the best move at all is to stay and plant it in your long-term financial plan and not listen to the short-term noise. Well, John, I appreciate you being on here today. This has been very helpful. Uh, hopefully our listeners have got a lot from it. We've talked about, you know, the market valuations. We've talked about the election. We've talked about kind of tuning out that noise, if you will, turn it into white noise like you would, would when you go to sleep. We've talked about the media. Uh, we've talked about the goalie, right? Sometimes the best thing is to do nothing. So a lot of takeaways from today, John. Really appreciate you being on The Secret of Success. And uh, best of luck over the next month because it's going to be a fun ride. Thanks for having me, Brett. The information provided in this presentation is for general education purposes and should not be construed as personalized legal investment or tax advice. Information contained within this presentation, whether charts, articles, or any other statement or statements regarding the markets or other financial information is obtained from sources which we believe are reliable, but we do not warrant or guarantee the timeliness or accuracy of this information. Nothing in this presentation should be interpreted to state or imply the past results are an indication of future performance. There is no guarantee that a diversified portfolio will enhance overall returns or outperform a non-diversified portfolio. Diversification does not protect against market risk. All indexes are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. Unmanaged index returns do not reflect fees, expenses, or sales charges. Index performance is not indicative of the performance of any investment. This recording is in no way a solicitation or offer to sell securities or investment advisory services. To determine which investments or investment strategy may be appropriate for you, please consult your financial advisor. The economic forecast set forth in this material may not develop as predicted.